today in our hot seat, we have Andreas Jacobi of Lingual. Hi, Andreas. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Let's get started. If you're ready, Andreas and Sarah. Sure. Let's do this. Welcome to C-Suite Hot Seat, the show where we put C-level executives from language service providers of all sizes in the hot seat. We will ask tough questions and get inspired answers. Our hosts today are Sarah Hickey, VP of Research, and Marek Jakubik, Localization Advisor at Nimzi Insights. So, Andres, in one sentence, tell us uh, what does Lingual do? Well, Lingual really uh, tries to connect all the shareholders and stakeholders of the translation industry with each other in a new and more automated way to kind of level the playing field between smaller and larger LSPs as well as freelance translators. What was the first career you dreamed of uh, having as a kid? Really was, uh, I wanted to be, be a pilot. Uh, so that was kind of like the big dream back then. When you're not working, how do you like to spend your time? Yeah, so the little time that I'm actually not working is spent uh, um, advising and working with uh, startups. Uh, so I'm quite involved in the startup community here in Munich, just helping companies to, to grow and, and just benefit from my experience, uh, having gone through uh, similar challenges. That's something that I really, really love doing. Uh, outside of that, of course, I love traveling. Unfortunately, that has been a bit more difficult lately. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, traveling is, is really one of my passions as well as just sports of pretty much any sort and color, uh, from <laughs> motorsports to skiing to cycling. So you name it. If you were given a chance to visit three different countries, which ones would you choose and why? Probably the, the safest bet for me is always uh, Australia. I love Australia. So uh, any chance I get to go to get to Australia, uh, I'll take it. Uh, the second one will be South Africa. And uh, the third one I would probably pick uh, Iceland, uh, simply because I've never been. And I really want to see uh, the landscape there. Uh, it's mm. supposed to be absolutely breathtaking. What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? It's much easier to give advice than to actually follow it yourself. Uh, so that, to me, that kind of was one of the biggest learnings. Just be patient and enjoy the ride. So that's one that I'm not particularly good at following, but I think it actually is uh, pretty good advice. I, I think another one that I, uh, I came across a year ago or something like that I actually really liked was uh, people tend to overestimate what they can do in a year and underestimate what they can do in 10 years. Mm. So that was one that really stuck with me and it kind of ties in with this entire theme of trying to be patient, going along the ride and, and kind of like even trying to enjoy the bumpy road. Do you have somebody mentoring you in the, in the translation industry? Um, yes. Yeah, so so uh, I think the, the, the closest person that I have in the translation industry is really my uh, long-term owner, CEO and uh, friend, Jean-Olivier Boucault, who is a... a um, more than 20 year veteran in the translation industry who built up Telelingua and who I've been working with for, I think it was more than seven years, very closely. And so if, if I don't know what to do, if I, I just need good advice, it's, it's him I call first. Obviously there's, there's a couple of more contacts that I'm uh, quite close with and in touch with, and you just discuss things, not necessarily also only from the localization industry, but also from tech, from legal, you know, all these different aspects of a company. So obviously you have, or at least I have a good network of people I can call if there's a problem and just, just to get advice, just to get another opinion or just to tell me how stupid I am. Uh, that's, that's, that's part of the journey. <laughs> that, that's a huge asset, that network, I believe. Um, yeah, and, and to me, it's just really important because, you know, there's there's network and network. And, and to me, the most um, valuable people in the network are those who are not afraid uh, of telling you that you're being stupid or that you're being mm -hmm. wrong. Uh, and uh, obviously, you being able to take that input from them uh, in a constructive way. Andreas, we, I feel like we know you a little bit better now. Uh, know a bit more about who you are, what you're like, what you like to do, what your dreams are. Now we're going to move into the a little bit tougher questions on the business side of things. Um, you were mentioning that you are um, working a lot with startups as well and that you give them advice um, because you've been in that same situation. So um, what inspired you to start your company? Really what inspired me to, to start our company was the, the realization at some point that um, automation in the um, localization industry is, is inevitable. Uh, so obviously we've got neuromachine translation, but also in terms of uh, processes. 
And I've basically seen that uh, a lot of LSPs are really struggling in that regard. So for me, it was very clear that this uh, that automation is kind of the future of, of the industry. Um, and there's kind of like no way around it. And uh, so basically for me, the idea was to automate everything that is repetitive and that doesn't really add any value to have a person being involved, but still keep all these parts where a human really adds value, mm -hmm. uh, that being in customer contact with the actual translation part. And uh, at the same time, this, um, and this is something that I've actually first seen happening, and this is that we're now seeing in a quite accelerated pace in the industry, is just consolidation. Fewer big players and basically this gap in terms of reach in terms of technical capabilities between the really big ones who can basically do it all, but sometimes lack in terms of quality and service. And then you've got the smaller ones that are really good at what they do. They love what they do. And I've, I've had um, the, the distinct pleasure of meeting so many owners of smaller LSPs that just love what they do and their heart is completely in it, but they're really struggling because they don't really know what an API is and how to set it up. They don't really have the marketing reach or don't really do sales because everything they do is just deliver great quality and service. And they just basically gain new customers through their network. And they're kind of really struggling trying to compete against the large LSPs. So for me, and this is this was kind of the vision of founding the company, was to combine this platform of automation, uh, neural machine translation engines, and just making things more efficient with mm -hmm. really connecting customers, but also larger LSPs with these small LSPs and freelance translators that otherwise just don't really get seen or don't get discovered. Just connect people that otherwise would not find each other. This entire technology part, APIs, automation, et cetera, is just completely taken care of by our platform so they can concentrate on what they're best at. What was like your breakthrough moment with that? Did you have one or in your career overall? Um, I think in my career overall, it was, was like really, really early days when I was still working at uh, Transperfect in London. Basically, I just figured out that I'm, I'm good at closing deals. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so basically I, I found out that, okay, um, if, if I go to customers and uh, uh, show them what, what is the best way and what is the best process and what are the benefits of it, uh, then um, they actually respond quite positively to it. And uh, so that's one of the big strengths that really carried me through my career so mm -hmm. far for uh, Lingual. The biggest aha moment was where uh, we, we kind of like built the platform, early days MVP, rough, really rough edges. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the first translators come in. Uh, we started with the first customers, beta customers that knew what they were in for. And uh, we just we just assumed, okay, the time from the customer really putting in their project to the first translators offering their services and putting in their prices would take a couple of hours, maybe a day. So we, we, um, we anticipated quite a big delay. And... Uh, like the, the first time we put in a project, I think we had the first um, order, uh, the first offer in within 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. And the, the the absolute crazy part, and this is something that I never anticipated, I never thought would, would, would actually be possible, was it was, I think, four weeks later, for the first time for one of the um, normal, uh, normal European language pairs, we actually managed to get the first offer in, in under 60 seconds. Wow. <laughs> Since then, we've been quite consistent at getting offers in below 60 seconds, sometimes 90 seconds. And this is something that I never thought would be possible. And that kind of completely ruined our feature pipeline. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, this, this was something that we just completely did not anticipate. But this was really one of the moments where we thought, wow, okay, there's, mm -hmm. there's something special about this. And there's something that... Um, really adds value on on both sides. Can you tell us what was maybe your biggest failure, would you say, and what have you learned from it? Oh, I mean, there's been so many things that went wrong and so many things that um, could have gone in a different way. But 
I, I can't really say that there's like one single biggest failure. And uh, so from my perspective, and, and you know that in Germany, we do not have the best failure uh, culture. Um, <laughs> but uh, I tend I gravitate a bit more towards the, the, the American way of thinking that um, any failure is just a learning uh, if you just manage to learn from it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not a complete waste. Something, especially as a startup, if you don't do that, you already lost. So yeah. failing, it's, um, I think the founder of um, Waze said that uh, very nicely. Um, startup is basically a journey of failing forward. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, so yeah. that's, that's kind of the culture that I'm trying to adopt. Obviously, it's not always that easy. Do you have a pet peeve when it comes to clients? The one thing that is, is, is probably a bit my bad pet peeve is I, I like the customers to understand what the process is and how it works even though sometimes the customer doesn't quite care. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you recall like a, a big challenge that you overcame? So, so many big challenges. <laughs> <laughs> so, so many big challenges. <laughs> I mean, so I, I think the, the, the biggest challenge that we've had was um, really the, the way our, our platform is structured is, is very modern, like API first with modules and so on. And just to really get to the performance that we wanted to have for the platform. So that was quite a struggle. And, and as it usually is, like we were struggling for weeks and all of a sudden, like you change a small thing and bam, uh, it, everything just completely changed. And all of a sudden, um, the module that was the problem was just times faster than any other module. So now we had the problem that all the other modules had needed to be faster as well. Aside from profitability, which of course as CEO you have to look at, um, what are the three main things that you spend your time on at work? Customer acquisition and customer retention, for sure. The second one would be product, uh, just developing, continuing, iterating. And the third, third one uh, certainly is people. Because as you know, people make the company and yes. uh, without them, you're nothing. How do you motivate your team or you know, how do you lead the team? What kind of um, leadership style would you say you have and how does that motivate your people? It's really about um, approaching people um, on the same level. Yeah? So even when you're talking to a CEO, to an intern, yeah? mm -hmm. so there's, there's still a person. And, and so this is something that I always try to do throughout my career is to talk to people just as people. Uh, so mm -hmm. they have their area of expertise. Uh, they know what they're doing. They're trying to do their best. And on the other part, it's really about this, this a, the right um, amount of pushing people and, and really just kind of like challenging them at the same time, giving them the necessary support for them to being able to achieve what we're trying to, to push them towards and just giving them enough freedom so that they feel like they can actually do something on their own and they can actually provide an added value to the company while at the same time giving them a support structure that doesn't leave them feeling lost. To me, and this is, this is one key element to how I'll try to lead and also manage, and that's kind of like the German in me coming through, is just, just being honest. Uh, so people yeah. always know um, what is going on. They always know, am I happy? Am I not happy? And But they always know, like, even if I'm not happy and I'm, I'm criticizing something, it's always constructive criticism and it's not about them as a person. But it's, it's just all about how can we do it better? Yeah? And I always say, like, um, there's this classical thing, the, the blame game. Yeah? So yeah. I always say, like, I don't care who is to blame. I only care who is responsible. At the end of the day, just trying to, A, fix it as quickly as possible and as customer friendly as possible. And B, making sure that it doesn't happen again. Basically, just acknowledging that and giving them the freedom to also come forward and say that, okay, I did something wrong or I think something went wrong here uh, or I need help without judging them for it, but just being able to support them. And mm -hmm. to this, this combination of challenging them, pushing them, supporting them and making them feel safe and valued. I think to me, that's kind of the, the, the winning combination, but mm -hmm. it's an intricate balance. What advice would you give to young entrepreneurs starting their own business in the language industry? Uh, don't overestimate what you can do in a year and don't underestimate mm -hmm. what you can do in 10. Basically, the bottom line being it takes time. Uh, it always takes longer than you than you thought. It's, it's really, really hard. It's, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of dedication. But if you do that and it works, it is worth it. <laughs>
<laughs> Good. I like this. This is a nice full circle um, wrap up to the conversation. Thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed um, having you in the hot seat. It was my pleasure, really. If anyone else feels like letting off some steam and you are part of the C-suite at a company in the language services industry, sign up with us if you dare to sit in our hot seat. Thank you so much for watching and look out for the next episode that will be published as a video on Multilingual TV and as a podcast on the NIMSI website. We'll see you there.